the bottom of the video player and change from native to translated. Welcome to the Digital Courage Memoirs. We have the a mass power of Digital Courage on the stage, Padlun, Rena, and Lena, whom you've seen in the previous talk. She took a sprint, and uh, we have two more guests, Claudia Fischer and Iot. Welcome to stories from the beer garden, or was it, is it from the wine parlor? Let's see and have fun. Yes, thank you for the strong applause that we will just imagine. Uh, best regards from M26, which is the abbreviation for Marktstraße 26. It's not just day three of RC3 today, but also day three of our new studio, which is why things took a bit long, a bit longer, and the one detail or other isn't working perfectly, but we're trying, and hopefully we will have fun doing that. Now the Corona warning, we had to do without any audience at the last minute, actually because we didn't think it wise. So we are talking to an empty camera, but you know that you are there with a small delay, of course. And we just imagine our audience. We open the windows regularly. We use these cubes for that, which you can actually buy. Then you can't buy them in the shop. You just uh, promote it independently, not even self-promotion. The nice thing is you turn it, turn it to give you to select the interval, and uh, it now says five minutes. Uh, so we will open the window for five minutes. There'll be a, a bleep every now and then, but you will realize it, it doesn't really bother us a bit. And speaking of Corona, that is the occasion that makes uh, that brought us here, actually. This, this retro thing is coming into fashion everywhere. This and that is being redone. This linear thing, TV, linear TV thing is happening. And I heard on the radio that the explanation by the psychologists is that with all the pandemic, we kind of like to remember the good old days when we could still meet and have rallies and events. And because we can't do all this, the only thing we can do is to wallow in the past and uh, maybe take a step forward with that and maybe consider what we want to do again as soon as we are allowed to and what we have done from our experiences and that's why we thought we would like to talk a bit about the old stories that are often kept aside and that normally we'd be telling each other on a sofa somewhere as we chill and that we normally wouldn't be able to tell at RC3. And because you can't, you can't say, tell them because you spend all your time meeting people at the real Congress. So where does digital courage actually come from? There are various reasons why we do things the way we do. And behind each of these, I think, is a story. Of course, we won't be able to tell them all. If we are lucky, we will make turn this into a longer format. Uh, so this will be a small selection. And then we will see. And the keyword of oral history is something that we will uh, feature here. And we will then see how the stories that make up our past can be lessons for the future. And we could perhaps say that the idea is to learn not just to tell anecdote, really? Well, sometimes perhaps, but it's about, uh, as it says in the title of the uh, event, it's to make people understand how we do, why we do things a certain way, even though many people say, no, we want it differently, but we have some reasons to use the yellow pins. Yeah, the thing with the yellow pins. So that is actually a hint towards our first topic because we 
always we often talk about frame building Rahmenbau in German and that means that we would prefer to meet in prefer meeting in a wine parlor to meeting in a pub and I believe that that goes down to the earliest beginnings Padelun, would you like to talk about this uh, uh, show the first photo and you can talk what were these beginnings and what does that have to do with uh, what's the connection to wine parlor well the beginnings or then Fubut were that Rena and I uh, uh, had a sequence of performances Eric Satie uh, a two-minute piece but if you repeat it 840 times it takes 14 hours and we invited people uh, into uh, we, we um, actually looked at the work of the composer who said that you should only eat white food and we uh, furnished a room uh, where people could listen and not just sit and listen but also move around there were beds you could sleep and a journalist uh, had his travel typewriter and started writing reports about the event in at where he was sitting that was great there were no laptops at the time this was a traveling typewriter that was very charming and uh, what we did wasn't that we played the piano uh, as you can see in this picture, you have Ulrich Schwer and uh, two pianists. They played, took turns, and we did the way that Igor Levit played it. You saw that it was became becoming more and more urgent. But we wanted something continuous and and stable because Eric Satie said, if you repeat the piece 840 times you should do that at, in greatest calm and relaxation. He didn't prescribe that it should be repeated 840 times, but you could. And if you did, then you should prepare yourselves in calmness. And we made sure that the audience also had calmness and a relaxing atmosphere. They could sit down, have some food, uh, have a lie down on a provisional bed. And it was all in a calming white arrangement. All the food was white because Eric Satie once claimed that he was would only eat white food, would, which, as we know, it wasn't true. But it, we know that he drank red wine. And how long does it take? 15, 15 hours, if you repeat it 840 times. Yes, and that was the duration of the event. Someone had to do the count and uh, uh, take the numbers because the genius thing in, of this piece, the Vexation, it's a fantastic piece. It kind of floats on its way and people don't, tend to not realize that it repeats because it's the opposite of an earworm. If it were an earworm, you would just run away screaming. You'd never be able to stand this. But this way, people that after two hours go out to the toilet, you can talk to them and say, could you just whistle the melody? And people cannot do it because they it, it kind of defies memory. It, it, the nice thing is, if I think of the Congress music that we keep hearing in the breaks, that is kind of a re rebranding or a re reimagination of this. And uh, we built a framework. We didn't play the piano ourselves. We provided a space, a frame, uh, in which people could spend time and communicate and during the whole performance we gave these people 15 hours of time which they could spend with each other where after half an hour or an hour they would notice nothing is happening this is not the big show i thought maybe something exciting would happen but no real people are just sitting down and playing the piano and other people are there hey i've got time i can talk i can get to know these people and one important thing eric Satie uh, called this music musique d'ameublement music as a piece of furniture or as a piece of room equipment and uh, that means that the music should be perceived like a chair that you can sit down and rest on. You 
don't praise it for its genius way of uh, it's the genius way its four legs are built and that's eric satie composed this music exactly for background and he was a pianist in bars he played other music as background music uh background for what was happening in the bar but he didn't want other music to be abused as background and from that music d'ameublement but Loon and I took their name for our took our name for our art project, Art d'Ameublement, Art as Furnishing. That is the publisher, the name of the publishers that we, um, the, the company that we created for some of our publications. And the frame we created, we applied to other situations. We noticed how well it works to give people a frame in which they could become active. We come from the punk movement. If a band is a band supposed to play, oh, they're too drunk, so let's get some other people on the stage. And it was about getting those stars down from their pedestals. Everyone can get involved. Everyone can be empowered and, and encouraged. I, I don't know how often people were booed off the stage, but it gets you forward. Uh, he, and the vexation turned this around. This piece by Eric Satie, that the audience is the important thing. That is what's happening there. The people that play the piece were part of the frame that was there to make people feel comfortable and give them an opportunity to get active, inspire them just enough and, and give them the freedom uh, and the pleasurable frame to make them do things. And this pleasurable frame is more as the wine parlor, not the pub. I can talk about this. We started out, first people came to us, the gallery that we had and talked to us. And then we decided, okay, we'll have a regular meeting on Tuesdays and we'll go to some place. And that's, that was a pub and that scared people away. They didn't want the pub. Uh, women would come in and uh, would be, receive a strange reception. So we thought we'd have to change something. So this, this avant-garde kind of ambition needs something else, a cafe, a wine parlor. And it worked. Immediately, people, other people came. But the pubs, um, this kind of spirit, this kind of intelligentsia spirit, that needs something else but this, this, this beer, uh, attitude. Um, the only thing that people uh, can think of if they want a cozy situation is let's have a drink in a pub and that's not threatening and it also has to do with the volume, the noise volume. It's good if you don't have to scream against a noisy background to and filter out what my opposite person is saying. If you have an, a pleasant, calm, based situation but if the volume goes too high it's not good anymore. And wine has something about it that is linked to inspired talk. Uh, so that is the frame building that happens in various places. And what does that frame have to look like to make the content uh, as I want it? And uh, how do you just make this decision? Palun, Palun, you said, you mentioned the gallery. I have a photo of that, actually. Ah, oh, yeah. So for those sitting at the M18, our original place, the Marktstraße, 18 Marktstraße, uh, those that uh, exit and enter this building, you may not recognize this, but this is actually the view through our shop window. Uh, that was the gallery you had. And uh, from there, you kind of migrated, to, oh, you came to the CCC. Yeah, maybe we have to add one thing. Others started out in a garage. We started out at a car dealership. What you see here, this room with um, the window, large window, was once a car dealership showroom. And the, uh, all of that is in Marktstraße 18. And this was our first exhibition. 3,000 Polaroids, and this right here is a self-made computer. I think it said 
Wir wollen das jetzt okay. nicht mehr erklären. Wir haben sehr viele sehr abgefahrene Veranstaltungen gehabt. Compared in Galerie, TV äh, in images, der keine Bilder, there were keine, a lot of Sachen, die in der Art waren, crazy exhibitions and installations there. So Not anything that could be sold, but um, just performative installations and stuff like that. And we also had the KS Computer Club as visitors for three days and three nights. So we didn't do art because we find it pretty, because, but because we wanted to get ahead. We were in the 80s and the uh, Cold War was raging. There was no future. It was all desolate. So we wanted to get ahead. We wanted progress, optimism, and we wanted to do something. And back then, viewing windows were mostly um, covered in old advertisements, and we wanted to do something new. And we did an exhibition that was even promoted by the state of North Westphalia, and we invited people that didn't understand themselves as artists, but as gardeners or hackers or even intruders. We had an intru intruder as well. But yeah, you really have to look at this image because what you see is a big monitor that was our TV. On that monitor, it shows um, a Schneider PC that took one and a half day to calculate a, S and a black and white stick figure. And next to that is my acoustic coupler. Yeah. That was the um, das ist genau bei der Gelegenheit. Das ist, uh, bei der roommate situation of Peter Glaser. Yeah, there's Frau Holland, Christian Wolf, who's now in San Francisco, and also Obelix. And that was an event with the other five, and there was an audience that knew them, and yeah, there's a word for that today. Back then, it wasn't there. There's, there were people with shining eyes, and they had this conscience of knowing where to go and where to take things, and this is what we were looking for. We didn't find it in art. Art became boring at some point. We also didn't know where to go, but we wanted to try ourselves out and this, these shining eyes were interesting and fascinating, and we just noticed we wanted to be a part of it. No, we didn't want to be part of it, but we wanted to co-create. We realized that a new world um, had been created. When was that? That was in 1985, December 85, exactly. And we had a dead XP and a Lent MUI, and we read the news from the next days that wasn't intended by the Washington Post, but it wasn't illegal because the the government didn't know that we were doing that, so there were no laws against that. So, all good. We saw, wow, that's a whole new world. And this is something we can be part of and we can co-create and this is not something we can just watch. This is something that hasn't been finished yet and we want to be part of its creation. Yeah, and it's art and culture and it's framing. So, in order to use a computer, you have to um, you have to put on in all screws and put it all together, and hackers open it all up. 
Christian Wolf said, you have to go to the KS Computer Congress. And I went there and I experienced it and I talked, I told it to Brina. And she said, it's not enough to have this once a year, we want to have it once a month. And the people from Bunker Ulmwall were only on jazz. Und hatten da and Lust the people drauf. from our group were all about jazz and they didn't want an, a change. And there was uh, this Bunker Ulmenwall is where we had a public domain. And in 1987, we were welcomed and we were overwhelmed by the this welcoming. There were 100 people in front of the door. So a mass of people, hardly anyone had their own computer, we didn't either, but we organized some, a C64 um, you can see there, and on the left of the camera and um, at the C64 you can see Oliver from Bielefeld who made our invitations on the C64. And we will see him later again. So just as a small spoiler. And then he went um, into the file sharing business. Well, in order to share files, you have to be online. So we just built a frame. And people had their computers at home. And what people did was swap floppy disks with information so that you were even able to do something on these machines. But there was also fascinating because software back then was often secured by um, copy protection and you had to get around that copy protection before you could use the copy. One or the other member of the audience may remember. And I think that was an ideal schooling because many people back then learned how to program. The first program of one of our friends, who we know since then from the public domain, actually wrote a floppy disk monitor to remove copy protection. And some other people enhanced those programs and fixed some errors and wrote some intros showing what they themselves could do. And that was a lively atmosphere and scene that used the full potential of the computers back then. We even used the complete Atari screen which wasn't intended by the manufacturer but you talked about bitnapping what is that i thought it was file sharing well it was the first time that from the group of young people approached us and said it's cool what you're doing but uh, would you like to do a copy party? And we said, what do you mean? And he said, yeah, like invite all of those people who share programs. And you have to know that back then there was this wicked way of contacting people postcards sent anonymously so you could go to the um, post office and buy this card of post, this kind of post postcard and 
you could get your mail with that card anonymously. And people did that extensively with floppy disks and shared floppy disks in that way. And the real copy party, we thought we wanted to do that correctly and invite all of the people that our boys were in contact with. So people from Saarland, from Holland, from all over the world um, came over, or all over Europe, probably, more like. And we sent out an invitation card, even. And all of those were numbered so that they were um, secure against forging, forgery. So yeah, they were unforgeable. And this numbering also incentivized people not to give the invitations to others. So yeah, only those invited were able to join. Yeah, that was through the contacts we had from Bielefeld and who we shared those special postcards with. And they checked in at Marktstrasse 18 and there was a greetings ceremony. Someone um, arrives with their computer. We called it bit naming, a bitnapping party. And they said, we want to go to the bitnapping party. So they arrived with their computers. And the one who had the most addresses said, wait, who are you? And do you have this and that game. And he said, well, I, I sent that to you last week. And this is how we verified that those were the correct people. So then we let them in. So many young people checked in and came in with their computers. So that was hard to hide, but we had a tremendous party. As you can see here in the World War II bunker, and nobody could leave for security reasons. So we weren't discovered, mobile phones weren't a thing. We kicked for everyone, it was a great party, it was fantastic. I was there with uh, Ralf for the second um, check-in and there was uh, 40 Dutch people we waited for and they just weren't arriving and in the end, we just went and <laughs> 10 minutes after we left Marktstraße 18, two boys rang to check in. We're just pressing the bell and someone tapped on their shoulder and said, you're, um, you're arrested. And they were brought to the police office, had to empty their pockets. They just rang the bill. Is a bell, is, is, that, is that criminal? Uh, it just turned out they had empty floppy disks and an invitation. So in the meantime, Marktstraße 18 had been discovered, but not the bunker where the party was. Yeah, back then it was already impossible to discover and follow the traces of all the nerds. But something happened later. People spent the night and we had a beautiful breakfast set up in the gallery behind the large window. And these two boys came back along who had had this unpleasant experience with the police. And the one said, my friend was arrested here yesterday. We just wanted to tell you that and warn you. And uh, yeah, some were kind of scared by that. And uh, well, for a few days then, nothing happened. And about four days later, we uh, just had 
uh, put back the software for the little Atari into back into the suitcase and and uh, carefully uh, we had this located uh, we located it outside and we just got it back and then three gentlemen with moustaches came around the corner we know what's happening now of course and that was our first police raid and the first and the reason why we have these uh, info signs here which you can buy in the shop how to behave uh, how to re respond to a police search uh, and this was built by another group. Uh, we can uh, buy this uh, sticker in the shop, uh, end of the advertising block. And what happened then was these people entered and said, this is the uh, criminal police house search. I said, a moment, please. Went back to our chaos room and said, Padloon, the police are here. Padloon goes to the front and said, gentlemen, you are fairly, you are kind of late four days after the event and uh, we then read the protocol that was uh, made uh, from from that visit our lawyer made it accessible to us and that said obviously th apparently they were warned fantastic and that meant that they didn't really expect to find anything of relevance and what they were interested to buy were the stickers with the chaos not which we, which we were printing at the time and uh, things like that. And they tried to prove that we uh, had put kids in front of computers and chained them, forced them to keep exchanging disc, disks to earn a living, which was not what we had done. So the procedure was simply terminated before it came to any courts. And, and we, we were just doing it the regular way and said, stop, we'll call our lawyer first. And the lawyer came along and uh, he uh, kind of acted very well. And it was very funny. And of course, police raid isn't funny. Uh, the first wasn't and the second wasn't either, but we won't talk about the second. Uh, it's going to become a series maybe then. So yeah, it is kind of unnerving. Um, these people come into your private place and they can look around everywhere, even the molded apples in the, in the kitchen. Uh, so these were people from the commerce department of the police. We know them by now because they contact us every now and then about the tour exit note that we run. Uh, so that gave us street credibility. Um, but I would have gladly done without this. And that, of course, is why you know how important it is to think about this in advance. How do I deal with this situation? Because, well, the brain doesn't really function that well. What's the number of your lawyer? Ah, it should be in here. No, it has to be in your head. Because if it's actually needed, which one do you mean, by the way? And I haven't memorized it either, and I'm annoyed at myself. And it's good to have the sign and, and note the number on this sticker. And we have it next to our entrance door. And uh, because that means that in the moment you are more calm. And, and I have to kind of take a small detour. That wasn't a great, but a small detour. One of our guys said, oh, let them come with the search. They won't find anything in my place. And we thought, well, let's see. So we conducted a house search at his place at four in the morning or six. No, maybe, I don't know, either four or six in the morning. But Loon thinks we went there at four in the morning, but I think six was enough in our circles. So we rang the bell, I kept ringing the bell, waited until someone would come out and banged against the door. And he, he had a real horror trip and we conducted a real house search. And it was as scary as hell. And we, he was there with, <laughs> Uh, with a baseball bat or something behind the door. Um, and that was the sensitive address list. But the, we found a letter. We found a letter uh, to one of his exchange partners, not the address list. And there's, a, there's some evidence in a photo later. Uh, right, so we uh, enjoyed that. <laughs> we trained 
uh, an exercise for a health search because we knew that in this situation you really forget everything. And after the second search that we won't talk about because we're overrunning completely, I can see Claudia is standing waiting for her turn after the second search. You actually wrote the opening hours, uh, posted them at the door because then you noticed uh, people won't come outside opening hours, 14 to 18 hours, 2 to 6 p.m. And the genius thing is if you mention your opening hours, it would be inappropriate to um, you break in and, and break through the door as a police person. So you go at the time when you meet these people. And that is an interesting point of information. So if you would like to select when the police should come, display your opening hours. Well, it won't quite work in, at a private flat store, but um, that will then get us to the next time and the next issue simply to uh, ensure that poor Claudia doesn't have to wait too long before going to bed. So we move forward. And quite often we'd had these David against Goliath situations. Uh, and we often thought we are so small, that's not possibly, we can't possibly achieve that. And you are always very calm about this. So I will now ask Claudia onto the stage who said she'd be willing to take my seat and maybe she can talk about why this, these situations, these David Goliath situations don't scare us anymore. I have to say, to me, it wasn't a David against Goliath situation at all. We just slipped into the Stop RF, RFID campaign against Metro, the large retail corporation. It just through a chain of events, it, it, it turned into this. It's about Stop RFID. We should give some background. And we asked Claudia, Claudia, can you get the keyboard over? Um, yes. As I change, I found a button, a sticker, and we have some of these in the shop too. But it looks very nice. It looks old and bad and simple. And this is an original that uh, I used when I came to the Metro company as a journalist. But I'll start from the beginning. It began in autumn 2003 when we awarded the Big Brother Award, the German Big Brother Award for their test supermarket called Supermarket, uh, called Future Store in Rheinberg near Duisburg in Western Germany. So they had these price tags that would radio an, a unique ID uh, for logistics, and sooner or later, surely this would lead to the customer's data being registered. If you pay, you can link this individual item to the customer. That was the basic idea. And we wrote an unusual kind of award speech, not the usual critical award speech this award goes to. It was more like a future scenario a story, and, and that went viral pretty well. It, it was published. Marion Z finds a note for a fine in her letterbox. Uh, the industry hated it. Um, you can still read it on the Big Brother Awards website, bigbrotherawards.de, and this interpreter translated this story into English, by the way. And we found an activist from the US, Catherine Albrecht, an anti-RFID activist. Uh, we were the only ones in Germany dealing with this, so she came over for a talk. And I think she said she would only come, she would give no. no to entice her to come, we will tell her we have this interesting store um, that you can visit. There is RFID in the wild in Germany, which was not the case in the US, and that uh, interested her and uh, that attracted her. And so on the Sunday, we had a public domain with her, and on this, this, the Saturday before we went to that future store, we actually picked her up from the airport in Dusseldorf, and from there, the, the store was on the way, we, we went there directly, and all that we are, I'm saying now, 
took place in a complete state a state of complete sleep deprivation. And we had this American with us who was wide awake and still, or perhaps exactly because of that, it worked so well. And uh, we visited that store and we received an endless amount of information. We had press people with us, the Metro Corporation had brought their press team along. There were 10 people around a single shopping basket. There are pictures. And we kind of, it was all in the days for us. We, we uh, so much happened. Which shopping trolleys, which displays are there? Which opportunities to delete the number? And you put the scales in the veg department, recognize the banana. Um, and we tried to record everything, and uh, but it was very hard. And uh, we had a whole group of people of the Fibot with us. Some people were just bored, and that paid off in the end. And uh, on the Sunday, we had the public domain event with Catherine, and we had a small device where we could show um, uh, what happens if you hold the device to the scanner. And by the way, this interpreter had his first interpreting stunt there, interpreting from English to German. And suddenly we noticed, oh, the number changed. We weren't holding a shampoo bottle up to the scanner. What happened there? So we tried around and what ultimately uh, emerged, that the customer card contained a chip, a payback card, the customer loyalty card. Someone actually asked it from the audience. Here, this is the Philadelphia cheese, the, 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 the cheese. Uh, so we can show you the various uh, IDs from the same product. And someone asked, how about the customer card, the loyalty card? We, want, we didn't believe it. They would have told us, we thought, and they didn't. Bettina, you've got one of these, haven't you? And you brought one of these along. And that was our trump card. And Bettina held the card up to the scanner and said, pling, and the number came up and we couldn't believe our eyes. And, and I remember how Catherine was sitting there with 20 seconds, speechless. And then she said, holy cow. Yeah, and what she said was that this was the first time worldwide that customer loyalty cards were RFID chipped, which made, that was the last step in making the link to the individual possible. And we hadn't been told. This had been done in secret. This, they had told us so much, but this they hadn't said, but Bettina out of boredom had had asked to be given a loyalty card. She went through the procedure of registering. She said, I haven't got this this customer loyalty card yet. Uh, it can be used in several shops. It was complete coincidence and it was completely crazy. And on the day we talked with Catherine and her and she said, this is huge. We can use this globally as a first and we have to do something. And we were thinking the whole night through and the next day we called Metro and said, we know that you've chipped your customer cards. You know that you didn't tell us. Now we need a statement from you because we are going to publish this. And what Catherine did on, said on the Sunday is that these chips and these cards can be x-rayed. So if you have an x-ray device, you can see that the, device, the chip is there. We need this photo. And I was working for the public broadcaster WDR and I had just been visited, I had just visited a hospital and I went back there, asked the, the, the doctor's surgery and I had called them. I said, I need to do this. And they said, crazy dear you, but yes, why not? And they x-rayed it and it was super obvious. There was an old x-ray film that was there uh, and uh, we still have the photo. And I took a photo with a digital camera and that saved us and the camera team uh, actually uh, melted down this slide. I held it up to a, a stage light, so the, the valuable image melted down, but I had had this digitally took and taken photo, and that saved us. Um, the original was lost. The, and I then had a date for the public broadcaster. Uh, as a journalist, I said, OK, I have to get off now. I have to, yeah, my mobile is off. I have to get out after two nights. I have to get away. I uh, hadn't had a lot of sleep, uh, never had, had maybe the least amount of sleep. And I came back and there was just, just one call on my mobile and that was Rena saying, we have a problem. Metro has responded and they uh, sent us a photo of a DVD stand where it said, there is a chip in the customer loyalty card, a warning that was displayed, displayed to the customers in the shop. And I was, and I'm so sure that these stickers haven't, weren't there when we visited, but we can't approve it anymore, said Rena. And despite all that, it's completely scary to, 
warn customers of the chip in the Leute card at the DVD shelf, not where you are given the card, but that's what they, what, what they had said in the response. So in the car, I said, I think I have a photo of that DVD shelf. So let me get home, let me check. And we were sleepless, as I said, and Rena said, they, they have these monitors where you can look at DVDs, uh, so take a photo. And I thought, I don't really know what's happening with these monitors at the DVD shelf, so let's take a photo anyway. So complete with with the child and, uh, on the photo, and I had the permission from the father. Uh, so it was really in the complete days, I had no idea what the value of that was, but we had this photo then, so we could prove that uh, there were only two, three DVDs that had changed position, but that on Monday they had added these warnings to disprove what we did. And to prove that this wasn't the case on the Saturday, so they had really, that was such a lie, and that really killed it, an obvious lie. And that was what motivated me the most. I have experienced a lot, but to know that there is a professional PR department that was really lying to me, into my face, that really, uh, when Catherine was back in, in the on the plane, I said, I, I'm really going to, I was quite furious. Yes, you, you were furious. You it seemed like you really, the only thing you wanted to do was work against RFID. And I said, oh, come on, uh, I, I really had to restrain you. Um, yeah, and on the Tuesday after that, when we had the regular meeting, we talked about it. And we had several people with us that had been, uh, that had seen this and that went to us because of that discovery and that, that were motivated to, to come. So that gave us the impetus. Yeah, we had, were 10 or 12, yeah. Um, not a mass of people, but we had 60 members at the time. But the, the point, you say that they had lied to us in our, to our face. That was a new experience for you. We uh, prepared a press release and we had put up these two photos, the one that the, with the claim from Metro that they had put up warnings at the DVD shelf and the Saturday photo and the Monday photo proved that they had lied. And uh, I had then, I was on the phone to journalists, for example, the uh, Financial Times journalist uh, that dealt with trade, and I said to her, uh, you probably won't believe it, but uh, this uh, press spokesperson had just lied, blankly lied to me. I, I, I'm speechless. And, and the lady from the trade department at FT said, oh, you know, I am dealing with these people every day, and every day people are lying to me. I believe you. Um, a fantastic article appeared in the Financial Times that took apart the issue, and that led to the fact that the uh, uh, stock market news and uh, the public TV uh, linked a fall in the stock value to the, uh, the debate about the chip card. If we would have known what put options are, and if we would have liked to play casino, maybe we could have financed for what a bit uh, by betting on a falling stock value. Okay, but there was something before that. We did a demonstration. You can see it there. We organized a protest. I don't know how well you can see it, but this image went around the world. It was printed in the US, in Australia, Germans protesting against RFID. There are friends of mine here on the picture from Düsseldorf, but also many people motivated across the internet from Heiser forums. Yeah, that was the first time people just took to the streets without a big um, call to action. And also, I brought you something after that. We printed postcards, um, Christmas po postcards, and sent them to Metro. I hope you can see it. And then there is a follow-up story that happened the year after, which I can shortly tell you. Yeah. 
wir haben uns durchgekämpft. Wir sind mit We, we just auf dem einen Bild auf der Odin Spielmann Hustle C. Ich muss noch dazu das, sagen, das war ja ein weltweites Event. Und it was a worldwide war, event, you have to say. And the interesting uh, thing war, was that for people in the US, it was in unbelievable that people are so worked up about something that they take to the streets in a snow chaos. Yeah, and we pulled that too. I know that one woman from Rheinberg approached us and said, I'm so thankful because I'm telling my neighbors all the time incredible things are happening and if these things um, will get through, the consequences will be bad and they declare me crazy and she just felt understood by us, by us and they knew that there were other people with the same concerns because data protection wasn't really an issue back then. And the good thing was that because of the demonstration, Metro wrote us a letter that they will exchange all the cards and never again use a chip. Yeah, they sent us a fax where they wrote that because of the very emotional uh, reaction, the cards will be re uh, will be taken back and exchanged with cards um, without chips, of course, without um, any logical reason. So yeah, that was a victory for us. And for me, that was the point where I saw how many people congratulated us and then said, wow, he can actually achieve something and started becoming active because they were now, they had now seen that this was possible. You can achieve something if you really get behind it and really um, get the knowledge and skills uh, you need. And I think for the data protection movement, that was a milestone, definitely, in Germany and in Europe. Yeah, you have to know that we were about 60 and six or 65 um, members, and Metro was the third largest worldwide trade group. So they really know how to fight dirty, and we were able to stand up against them. And we were warned against. They really said, we, you need to keep your track record clean. You have to really make sure that uh, mm, your uh, cleaning lady is moonlighting and so on. And we thought that was, that was um, exaggerated, but this is exactly what happened. There was a, an event from the um, political information um, agency of the uh, government that was funded by Metro. And I went there. Of course, I didn't do any activism there. I just listened to their explanations and knew that I couldn't talk critically to any of the uh, journalist colleagues and there was a misunderstanding where someone said I was from the um, state information agency, I, whereas I just introduced myself as a journalist from the WDR. That was what I said and they misunderstood it, but uh, Metro then wrote me a letter I went hold it directly into the camera in April 2005, so 15 months after the protest, to the um, direction of the studio where they say they're concerned about the state of the um, public broadcasting agencies and that I shouldn't be able to work as a journalist for them. They didn't just write, uh, write a letter, and but also posted a, a photo 
die ist ja auch im Internet where I'm reading dabei, the war, Laudatio, which is totally isn't a secret, because it's publicly available as a video. I read that uh, speech there, and the photo was sent. It was an evening. There was an evening event from our studio, and my um, boss said, um, we have to talk, and I uh, thought, oh my god, what have I done? But yeah, he said, we have to look at that. That uh, Metro apparently says, um, I can't work as a journalist anymore, and my boss was very understanding. Sorgen um den Zustand des öffentlich-rechtlichen Rundfunks, wenn ich da arbeiten gab, dann macht er sich Sorgen um die Metro. Das ist And he replied that he was actually worried about uh, Metro if they were this afraid of a local journalist. And this could have cost me my job if I didn't have a cle clean track record and I didn't have that fantastic boss. Yeah, that was really a good boss he had back then. And this is really someone you want at as, um, in this position. So uh, also I've always been clear about that I um, couldn't do data protection issues because I'm um, privately an activist. So I always refuse those jobs and this is how I could remain in the business. They even wanted to do a press campaign and I said no, what's protecting me right now is to distance myself from that situation and we went through with that. But later I gave an interview about it two or three years later. I was in contact with Monitor at that time, and a Monitor journalist approached me about this. Apparently, um, rumor is uh, very quick in that community, and it can really cost you a job. So, years later, this story could have went badly for me if I'd done something wrong. So yeah, fight against Goliath, but keep your track record clean. Yeah, this is something that's really important, especially if you like, if you step out of line, like, for example, using illegal devices to have proof about illegal activities. Yeah, you really should keep your track record clean. Something I learned from the Metro story was that coincidence just writes the best stories. We could have never done that with our work. Coincidence just played into that. So if you were ever to make an Edward Snowden movie about this, people would say it's so unrealistic. But yeah, this is how it happens. And we're also telling this because um, this coincidence was so important. It was basically magic. It doesn't exist, but it works that such coincidences happen. And also that you see them and seize the opportunity. This is the important thing. She's saying that because she's less esoteric than me. So I'll pass the mic now. Thank you very much, Claudia. That was really good. Rina said this story was important, um, so I did. I know the situation. She's always right, it turns out, in the end. So, yeah, just doing something, just starting out and working on it and not being discouraged by doubts, then you can 
force down the metro group. So now let's take a step back and get back to the Congress. Rina, you were one of the first women on stage at the Congress. What was that like? I think there were two women, right? Yeah, the other was Uschi, Ursula Wetzel from Frankfurt, who I'm still in contact with. Great woman. So, Padalun and I came to the Congress. We were carrying gray boxes that we still have with some sort of stuff. I think we had an Atari and we had black um, bataclavas uh, from Canada because it was really cold. So we were fully masked entering and people were opening the door and saying, hi, Rina, hi, Padaloon. Yeah, I was feeling well and at ease right at this moment because this is where I belong. And when walking around, I was wondering, well, where are the other women? There were 350 boys and I met one other woman, Ushi, great woman, but she did the Chaos Cafe, she baked the buns and this is the moment I swore to myself, well, I like cooking, but this was the moment I swore to myself, I'll never work the kitchen at the Chaos Computer Congress. And I was asking myself, why aren't any other women coming? What is keeping them from coming here? Are they afraid that they won't be acknowledged or so I tried to invite women to the um, Congress from the University of Bremen, from the um, computer science a group. They even wrote a book about women in computer science. And I invited the women to the next Congress. And it turned out, well, first women had a lot to do between Christmas and New Year for their family and the other, they were afraid of being laughed at by 350 computer freaks. And I said, okay, if you don't want, I'll do it alone. So we just did a workshop. We sent out invitations for KS Computer Congress. We really got into organizing and acquiring people and this is how we got the Hexen workshop. And a lot of women actually came. Yeah, the word Hexen, we had that at the fifth public domain in the invitation. Yeah, it's actually Pat Loon's um, invention, the term. Printed with our new needle printer, an invitation for hackers and hexen. So the hexen workshop, and this is where actually women came, felt invited, and that was fascinating. Maybe if I can quickly just tell you that I have a workshop afterwards. So one of the women said, I only do graphics on the Mac. Another said, I write texts when asked what they were doing on the computer. And a third said, I only do Unix. Only. And I said, wait, do you hear yourselves? What are you saying? If a guy was say, uh, sitting here, he would say, I'm the Unix cracker and all other systems are shite. Is it like that? Yeah. This was an eye opener, and we talked a lot about what annoyed us. And one of that, those points was that women said men don't really try 
when explaining things to us. If I'm stuck at something, my boyfriend doesn't say, why don't you try this or that, or why don't you type in this command, or uh, maybe try that website. No, he takes my keyboard and just says, oh, let me do it, instead of explaining it to me. And then at this um, Hexen workshop, I got to know Barbara Twings from Hamburg, who back then lived in Berlin, and we said, let's try and ask hackers to explain a technical topic for us. And we did that at the first Congress between uh, there was uh, in February at the well in, in 1990 there was the first congress in East Berlin at the House of Talents and there Barbara and I filmed for two and a half hours which we turned into an eight minute video clip and we shortened that to five minutes and we'll show it to you now and there's a lot of fascinating, interesting people in there. We even um, put subtitles on it yesterday so that you can see who is in there and who is who. Yeah, so there's a lot of um, the pioneers from CCC. So let's look at this shortened version. And you can look at the long version on our YouTube channel, Digital Courage. Um, so what is it called? Um, how do you... A printer driver drives the printer. Hmm. Well, no. Somehow... How do you call it? There's a camera. Um, not yet. But this is not Breakfast TV, is it? No, I don't know. The printer driver is... Well, they really don't really touch my area of interest. Oh, printer driver. Oh, that's difficult. Uh, it is a program. A text processing program? No, no. It's either a part of, uh, of text uh, program helping you to co communicate to the printer, or it helps you to send the data to the printer. What is a printer driver? Well, I've actually given up communicating with printers. A printer driver? That is someone who is standing next to the printer with a whip and says, oh, come on, printer. Was that wrong? Well, that is something like uh, like an, on an old slave boat, the, the drummer there. It's a driven piece of software. Uh, uh, come off the connection between computer and printer, right? Uh, software, mostly. I, I don't really know, though. I, I have to tell the printer what to print, right? It translates uh, what the program wants to execute, whatever it executes. Uh, it has one kind of format of executable program, and if it translates that into a certain format for an individual printer. It sounds interesting, I don't know. A printer driver translates a certain output format by a program into a certain input format for an individual type of printer. 
such as uh, American Standard uh, 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 Interface or something like that. And, it's, and you know, it says American, it seems like the whole world uses it. Uh, anything else? A printer driver. It's a necessary part. It's the necessary information software that you need to have your bits and bytes uh, in the right form so that the printer can take it and so that the type XY of the printer can deal with it. Um, the program says print bold and the printer knows it's supposed to print in bold and it does whatever it has to do with its printer to print in bold. Uh, information is transferred so if something is to be printed in bold, so it has to, the printer driver has to be there to tell the printer to print in bold. Uh, 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 hang on, uh, and yeah, uh, something. And then there is something like the umlauts, they have to be made done right, and uh, if any problems like that occur and the printer doesn't do anything, then that is mostly the fault with the printer driver. You have a text processing or a graphics program, and to make that print, uh, talk to a specific printer, Individual printers have different printer drivers so that they can be talked to. Do you want to do it? No, I don't have a printer. Okay. Um. I believe, I assume that you want me to show, you want to show me using highfalutin words, I'm, I'm not going to do it. Um, I want to maintain my information self-determination. Filmed in February 1990 at the Kokon in the House of Young Talents in East Berlin, uh, shortened and subtitled in 2020. So now we know what a printer driver is. Now we all know, and it starts from the beginning. Press, press pause, please press pause. Um, never mind though. So we now know, everyone knows what a printer driver is now. And of course you can now imagine why it wasn't so simple in those days to find out or to have technology explained to you because there was a lot of erring and humming. Uh, some people simply didn't know and wanted to overplay that and, and make fun, make, make light of that. And some really tried. Uh, Pengo or Rob uh, were really answering very seriously and trying to express it in an understandable way. And others were just simply talking nonsense. And as I cut the video, edited it, uh, and kept looking at these extracts to find the right snippets, uh, it, it was using Umatic at the time in a studio at the, uh, oh, I don't know who. Um, I realized that Stefan Weirauch always when he talked with Barbara raised his one eyebrow and when he talked with me he would raise his other eyebrow. Barbara, blonde with a camera whom he didn't know and he didn't know that she was a cool programmer and he knew me so he knew this woman has to be taken seriously. Hmm. Hmm. Barbara, then generations before the UT2000, uh, gave an introduction to the uh, millennium bug to prevent the catastrophe from happening. Okay, but jumping back in time a little, feminism is something that you uh, in inserted in various places and also in 19. 89 when you went became an internet provider didn't you could that, could you describe it that way i wouldn't describe it that way uh, but yes you can see here the bionic um, that was a precursor i like to explain that what we did at the time was well we were something like an internet provider which was nonsense we ran a mailbox system 
uh, store in forward that was a wonderful piece of software uh, bionic is the name we gave it bielefeld mailbox um, and but also because we wanted to have, have wanted to give it a certain life of its own uh, something organic from technology can i hear can i detect the frame building from that yes so we wanted to people that had an enthusiasm for technology and were using a mailbox. So we were calling our way through to them. We had a modem from early on. Uh, and because we misheard something, I heard 50 euros and it was then 350, not euro, but German mark. Uh, so we had the modem and uh, we called ourselves into those mailboxes. And yeah, it was fascinating and it was fun. And still, what was really interesting is that we wanted our own system. We wanted to try what you can actually do with that, rather than just discussing technology, downloading software. Uh, we didn't download much software. We were not the kind of pirates, copiers. But that was the communication. It, it was about communication, about texts, uh, about how to deal with the new medium. The system operator, you as a user could talk, chat to the system operator, uh, but these people were busy doing other things. They, they they should do other things. They shouldn't should be communicating not with the operator but with other people. We wanted to extract ourselves from that, and uh, this mailbox. What we did there, we called it our Bielefeld experiment, and we wanted to find that. We knew that this kind of communication would permeate through the whole world. However, people would defend against that and resist it. Uh, it would become, we knew that this was going to happen. And we wanted to find out how this should be dealt with because we had people that would send one message that was charged at 20 Deutsche Mark. And uh, that was completely crazy. There was a professional system called Geonet and the interface looked very much like what we decided for. Maybe the other way around. Ours looked a bit like GeoNet. Maybe they, well, let's just start from where we were. GeoNet was the precursor, I think, pretty, I'm pretty sure. And you can see it's simply text on a monitor, and you could enter simple commands. Uh, German words, uh, German words as commands, such as read or send in German. You could abbreviate this into two letters, and that way you could uh, start working at a very short, after a very short amount of learning. There was a graphical uh, interface, hypertext-like. Well, no, but before we get lost in the details, somehow, you realize that data protection is rather important. Yes, this is the way it works. You see the door there uh, next to Rena's head. And if you took that door and went to the into the kitchen to the right, you could always look at the screen because it could have crashed. We always were looking at a monitor. Something is happening. So if you were curious and you see Maybe I can just insert, there are two protagonists in the story and their names were changed by the editors. Uh, I don't know where, in which way they were changed. They are now called Frank and Martina. Okay. So we look at the monitor and at one glance we see what's on the monitor. There's not a lot of information there. So I saw Frank was just logged in and wrote, send Martina. That, well, that's what he typed in, and the first title line was, Dear Martina, and that, the moment was, oh, hang on, Frank has something going on with Martina, but I also realized immediately this is just not the way to go. I, this is none of my business. If someone discreetly, if, if Frank or Martina will tell me discreetly, but not I as the operator, I shouldn't have that information. That is none of my business. And this Frank, the name is very different. Uh, it, we are still very good friends with Frank. We want to stay that way. So he 
came to us on the same day because he had he would spend a lot of time with us and i told him frank i saw you voting to uh, martina i think this is none of my business you are not going to leave before uh, i can't see anymore who is writing to whom we don't want to see this we don't want to see when messages are written and we don't want to uh, spy into users mailboxes uh, there's inboxes and that was the beginning of encryption in the software the mailboxes the inboxes were no longer readable by the operators even not if uh, i would be looking into the hard disk and the the folder there and uh, actually inspected the files sold for this user that was no longer possible because it was encrypted using the password of that individual user and before that you can see what we were seeing is what other people were doing at the time on the computer we could read it all and machines can still do that and get the information out so we were the surveyors the spies we and i realized uh, we had this was a late another late evening experience when someone tried three times to log in and the way he kept correcting himself typing i met him on the market the next day and he said you had a lot of whiskey inside you yesterday didn't you and he said well, how do you know and uh, and that is all possible automatically but but at the time it was a huge realization what can i actually find out about others smallest details uh, where people and we had a lot of people communicating and so who communicates with whom i realize and that has to be concealed because this is really dangerous information if we were evil people which sadly we are not um well i'll take back the sadly um then we could have done incredible things with that but uh what we wanted to do is a better digitally connected world and uh, we dealt with the software we met the programmers we uh, made suggestions and what's the direction we go and together with that software we were in a team the software is called Cerberus, the Cerberus, the hellhound and it's a three-headed hound isn't it well uh, hound is a bit harmless it's the hellhound the people that know the early mailbox scene know that there was another program called fido fido is the, the cute dog the the pet the uh, kind of uh, harmless uh, mixed race dog and that's the explanation for the name because that's the way the computer had been built so fido was the system where a lot of control was exercised or could be exercised where the operators were reading things and even censoring private messages going from one person to another they went in between there if they found it inappropriate and we had live reports at a public domain one of our events so we didn't want that and the Cerberus software uh, was very convenient was very that was the wilder kind of variant that always finds its way of getting one head out of the sling and that was the name of the software that was run at the bionic mailbox and um you could either go there directly and uh, uh, enter commands at the command line and there was a so-called friend that i could give a quick call to and get a compiled file from uh, pick put down the phone and the uh, computer at home would then unpack the file giving me my own interface and that made it possible for many people to use the same phone line before that there was phone calls charged by time and uh, every few minutes more money was charged and uh, the longer you were connected the longer it the more expensive it was and we had people that uh, uh, had uh, were in large debt with the German post office and the calls were long distance calls and there were public messages uh, where the users could pick them up using a local call from their next uh, mailbox and uh, their next hub and uh, the messages that were sent again were distributed with local calls it took a while to distribute these messages it was low tech and low cost 
and it made a lot of things possible for civil society movements, environmental movements. The Chernobyl, Chernobyl accident was a recent event at the time, and people started to exchange radioactivity measurements and things like that. And here in the picture, um, other than the post, what you see back there were the PCs with the modem, uh, which you could uh, connect to each other using novel links. Yeah, and they were running MS-DOS and yeah, uh, where I'm pointing, you can see, yeah, unregistered mo modems. Now we have to get ahead. I noticed that we had to put, take a lot of topics out of our schedule, but, um, well, we mentioned Fubot a few times, and we wanted to explain why we changed the name but this uh yeah this topic had to go there's a video where we explained it why we chose the name and so on and why we call digital courage now and you can find it under um, digital cor digital courage dot video and you can find it there under the keyword uh, Fobot. So Fobot, uh, this is used to be our name. Yeah, so those were the Fobot times. Next topic, something about telephones and the local tariff. Someone once said, a journalist, I think, that in Zagreb, no, in Sarajevo, there should be a Bielefeld Memorial. Yes, it was in Zagreb. So why should there be a Bielefeld Memorial in Zagreb and who said it? That was at an event many years later. The reason was that after the civil war in former Yugoslavia started in 1991, someone came to us who was a peace worker there and who tried to teach violence-free resistance to people, for example, to protect buildings from being um, raided, so blocking them without violence. And he worked with troop, uh, peace troops on both sides, and he noticed um, that he was running into trouble because communication didn't work because of all the different um, republics that were founded um, that blocked ways of communication. So you couldn't just phone from Serbia to um, Moldavia and so on. And the radio services um, were only heating the civil war movement. And it was so important for those uh, peace troops to have a means to communicate with each other. And Erik Bachmann, who was a, a draft dodger from um, the US, he was very much involved there. And he invented a chain of faxes. So uh, the, in, in Serbia, they sent a fax to London. In London, they squashed it back into the device and sent it to Serbia. That was very expensive because of the graphical transmission and also the quality was bad and it took a lot of time and it was a lot of work and then they said, well, isn't there a thing called mailbox that it should be easier? And so he came to us and asked us all of those questions. How does it work and how do I install it? And yeah, he really got into it and 
he started installing mailboxes over there and there was a whole network that was called Samia. Samia means uh, for peace, like peace, like Mir, like the um, space station and they were locally run by peace troops that again had contact with us in Bielefeld because the trick was they couldn't phone between Serbia and Croatia, but um, foreign um, telephony was still possible. So this is how Bielefeld became the transmission station for phone calls between uh, Zagreb, Belgrade, Sarajevo, Tuzla, also in Bosnia, Pristina, and I'm missing one, Ljubljana, yeah, in Slovenia. So, there is a lot happening there. Sarajevo was um, under occupation for three years and they smuggled computers into the city using tunnels and they managed to have three telephone lines and smuggle them into the country because back then in Germany a new telephone line was 100 Deutsche Mark and in Bosnia it was 1000 or 1500 but they managed to acquire different telephone uh, three different telephone lines and you have to imagine 5000 people in Sarajevo used this mailbox yeah in order to contact their relatives and not be cut off from the rest of the world because uh, that basically made them go crazy and all that ran over Bielefeld yeah of course our telephone bill was insane something like 8000 Deutsche Mark but Erik Bachmann managed to um, file an application with the Open Society and they took care of the telephone costs. That was a great project. I later visited Sarajevo for a legal uh, issue and I was looking for a lawyer who speaks German and who consulted me and at the end I asked, um, so what do I owe you? And he said nothing, I used Samia. And that was really important for us. And he explained that with the Samia network, he found his brother who was lost and could tell his mother that, yeah, finding your loved ones again, this is something that we can't appreciate in the society we have right now with our all our riches and prosperity. And yeah, we also learned that you have to be really careful with certain information. We learned that in war countries, you really have to encrypt and have to take care um, of your information because you could be shot. And this is not a joke. Wow, that's a heavy topic and you can see how important communication is in peace work and anti-conflict work. Well, that fits our next topic. Let's get right into it and um, do the time warp again. We'll need another video. No, the video is only at the end. We did a little bit of preparation. So we have another guest. It's the Active Congress, because we organized different events for networking in the German data protection movement for all those who want to be active. Yeah, unfortunately, because of coronavirus, um, there was a lot of standstill. So, control room, can we add Yacht? 
And I don't know where we can see or hear him. I can hear him. Hi. Hi, here I am. Here you are. Now tell us what are your best memories from the Congresses? The best memories are the community and the motivation you get there. If you live at, um, in a rural area, not Berlin, where so many activists are around every corner, the Active Congress is one of those events where you can meet peers and get motivated because if you spend much time in your small village it's difficult to find the motivation why am i even doing this and the active congress makes this is, is completely different you get to know people and Afterwards, you go home with new friends and new motivation. You know what you're doing it for. You get told great stories about what people have done. You're not alone. You can commiserate with other activists, get input from them, get ideas, inspiration for how to make things better. You can visit workshops and also the socializing in the evening after the workshops is really, really important to me. Sit together, have a beer or maybe play table tennis or go bowling, whatever. That's really great. And I met a lot of great people there, also from Digital Courage, from also on, on crypto parties, workshops and crypto parties on the Active Congress. Thank you for your report. Anything else you want to add? Because we now have a video to show, which we produced. Yeah, if you have the chance, absolutely go there. Also, you can find a European replacement fr um, with Freedom Not Fear, because Active Congress is pretty much German specialized. Now, we wanted to present the Active Congress to you. This video is from, oops, I don't know when, but yeah, it's in Hattingen. It started in Hamburg and then we moved to yeah, we went to Hattingen in the Red House. We would like to have Active Congresses again. Let's see when coronavirus will permit it. So it's a little bit of an older video, but maybe you will recognize one or the other person. Let's play it. Eine Vernetzung der verschiedenen AKs untereinander. Networking the AKs with one another. The working groups. AK is short for Arbeitskreis, so working group. TIV. V is for Vorratsdatenspeicherung. So, um, saving data. Yeah, data retention. C for CCC, Big E for Electronic Administration, Z for Census, as well as Censorship. Ich 
Ganze. Laut Computing. Verwaltung. Es wird sehr viel moderiert. Das ist einerseits natürlich ein bisschen einschränkt, auf der anderen Seite ist es sehr, sehr ergebnisorientiert. Dass wir jetzt auch einige Sachen, die so nebenbei laufen, über die sind man sich im Mailingliste so, mal ein lang den, den, den Mund nicht redet. Hier beim Bier mal eben. Some things you talk about in the mailing list for um, days and days, and here you can just um, talk about it in three minutes. Active Congress is um, organized every year by Digital Courage EV. And it's starting from the beginning again. Are we back again? Well, we lost Padelun. This is what happens in live events. Um, we need bio breaks. He'll be back soon. This was the Active Congress. We have a similar Europe-wide event with Freedom Not Fear. We also have a video, but because of how far time has progressed, we'll skip this video. But for the next topic, we need Padelun, so uh, we might just as well show it. Freedom Not Fear pilot uh, here is a pilot and, uh, project erzählungen sicherlich fortführen and i'm sure that we'll be able to continue yeah, this uh, round of talks immerhin anders als der aktivkongress findet freedom not fear weiterhin statt dann der active congress freedom not fear is continued in the digital realm and has taken place also with a little world that was nice yeah that's something you can look at but now let's get to the next topic one of my favorite topics so we have to do it there was this product well there are several products in our shop we haven't really talked about the shop yet uh, why how that came about and why it's needed but one product there is part uh, has just come out and it's linked to the camp in the Netherlands or one of the camps there and that is has a very nice arc with, around it so I'd love to hear from you about that yeah, that was education for nerds right so we have do we have this in uh, the playlist you start while I fiddle around Okay, the issue of video surveillance uh, in the early 2000s, that was something that kept us quite busy because of various pilot projects that were happening and, and changes to the respective police laws. And we drove it to the extreme and uh, had this and we imagined video surveillance of public toilets uh, of, of toilets and that we thought that was the worst thing that could happen so we had this action that just uh, we designed these stickers that, that said in Dutch English and German for reasons of hygiene this toilet is monitored by video thank you for your cooperation and if you uh, have uh, if you ever joined the uh, workshop on social engineering that one Dutch person ran, you know that you always have to give a reason. If you want to extract information from someone or get them to do something that they actually do not want, then you state some kind of reason for security reasons and here for hygiene reasons, uh, this toilet is monitored. Complete nonsense, but people kind of understand. It's incredible. And Padlun and I went to that camp in the Netherlands that was held on a university campus. Uh, there was tents everywhere, the whole infrastructure that hacker camps have. And uh, there were all kinds of Dixie toilets, the, the, the small toilets, uh, the cubicles there. Oh, so, okay, we have said, what a shitty job. And we stick, stuck these signs, put these signs up there and made sure that they were all 
and supplied with with our stickers and that created some quite funny effects and we were able to see how even hackers believe things that are just put up there as a claim and elo although it says big brother awards.de at the bottom there it, yeah that was a small hint but not everyone saw and uh, some funny things happened and uh, we noticed that in a tent there was a hotly uh, it was hotly debated whether that was actually permissible in the netherlands and if it was permissible if perhaps even one toilet should be supplied without a camera just one which would have been completely sufficient for thousands of people of course and uh, Elsewhere, people said, I'm just going to visit the toilets that don't have the stickers. And of course, some people had taken them down already as a souvenir. And um, of course, but, but the crowning bit was that um, someone came to us and said, ah, oh, some of us have gone crazy. I've seen people that, that take, took a toilet apart and uh, the day after, we were sitting uh, at our nice little fuboard presents and we had these stickers lying around there for sale and uh, we had all kinds of things there and then someone put them there and someone came and oh no they are from you you, you did those we took a toilet apart to find the camera yeah, hackers, right? Hackers unscrew things, take it apart and look, for, but they didn't find anything, right? They didn't find anything. And so we had these stickers just in German. Uh, we did them for the shop and they are a complete hot seller for flat share kitchens or toilets in flat chairs and also for spread passing them on. And uh, I said, we are fighting against video surveillance and uh, that played a role later on. Uh, but uh, these brief, uh, take the detour via the shop, okay? So we had the shop, we started it in 2004 because through the snow, uh, we couldn't go, we couldn't go, go by car because the roads were blocked in the winter. So we couldn't take the t-shirts with us that we wanted to give these people. I think that was the rally that was mentioned earlier. So. Uh, 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 volunteer AXA just to put this shop together as a website uh, where these t-shirts could be bought and it was great because we could spread things and uh, so we thought that this toilet sticker was so successful that uh, it, it, it would get people thinking so well about video surveillance and, and the nonsense of it and of course it's always nonsense so we wanted to spread the word so we thought these A5 format, A5 format stickers in several languages, that wouldn't be possible cost in terms of cost. So we made these very small stickers, they were fairly cheap. And we bundled 10 together so that people wouldn't just have the one. Uh, so we uh, charged five German marks at the time. So we wanted them to have one for their own and place and five to give away to kind of spread the thing exponentially. We all know this, know this by now. And by having this kind of shop, we could have people order them at any time and, and back them up, post them, and they were hugely successful. And it always worked. Uh, it, it, and this played a big part in the next story. They work until today. And the next story is one of my favorites. But I think Rena can tell it nicer. Or you tell it together. No, no, I'll just interrupt her. I'll just slap you. Um, so. Oh. This is Axel, our volunteer. Hi, Axel. Um, in our shop window, he had the, the, no, our display window. There was this campaign. And here are some Fibut members soldering RFID detectors, which we also sold in the shop. The, the, the shop became uh, the support tool for campaigns. So we have mailboxes there. But please continue the story. This is what this is about. This is what this next story is about. Right. 
So the Red-Green Coalition in Northern Westphalia, the governing coalition, had decided to allow video surveillance in public spaces around the year 2000, 99, 2000. And uh, of course, we were against that. But the um, government in Düsseldorf were just playing daredevils, and they ran the pilot project to find that video surveillance is a completely sensible, sensible thing to do. It would reduce crime. And this pilot, of all places, they held in Bielefeld, in, just in front of our noses, in a park around the corner. That's where the venue is, that we, that where we have held the Big Brother Awards for many years. It's a nice park in the inner city with a very normal crime rate, I would say. And that was mainly uh, composed of drug trafficking, drug, drug dealing and all that, very normal. Um, however, the, within the Social Democrat Green Party coalition, the deal was that they would reduce the age at which migrants would be accepted, and on the other hand, the Green Party would accept the video surveillance, and we, yeah, strange deals, right? And uh, we were against that, and there was a conference by the uh, delegates uh, for the Green Party, and the Greens from Bielefeld were on our side, uh, and the, all Northern Australian delegates met. So we said, we'll put up, uh, we'll, we'll have a stand there. We, this is our info display, but when we were registering for that, they decided there would be no space, sadly, for our stand. It doesn't look like it, does it? Um, so we used one of the techniques that we like to use to how do you hack your way into a party conference you come up come very early in the morning you are the first to just put up your uh, place and someone from the tv actually helped us to position the lights the right way um, so we had a miniature display with these trees and all that, um, with the saying things like uh, blanket video surveillance, uh, introduce video surveillance to prevent blanket video surveillance. How are you going to explain that to your children? Because that was the argument. If we don't introduce it now, then the evil conservatives will come and that will come all over the place, which was complete nonsense. But the actual story comes now. The video surveillance issue, we'll explain that later in another session. So video surveillance was set for 11 p.m. So we kind of wanted to take a little bit of pressure out of it. And actually, we had a lot of contributors, and we had to draw um, draw sticks as to who would um, have their contribution. And it was a lawyer. Gilem Achelpöhler, who very clearly lined out why public video surveillance is detrimental to our fundamental rights. And then there was a woman who said, my predecessor explained it um, really well legally, so I don't have anything to add to that, but any woman who has ever been at one of the toilets here, um, you should know that the toilets are under video surveillance. And I was standing at the door of the room grinning, and the organizer came to me and said, those stickers, those stickers, that's you, right? And somebody asked, why video surveillance? And I said to her, 
Isn't it unnerving that people here assume that this could be true? And what happened was she went back to the stage and said, here is, there's no video surveillance. And then the uh, four voices at, at once were saying in a choir, but it says so right here. And there was a two-thirds majority against video surveillance on in the vote. We didn't expect that. It was great. Yeah, our stickers really had an effect, maybe more than ourselves. The good thing about uh, the bad thing about political work is that you don't really see the success. But in that case, it was really great, it was really fun, and we still have fun with it today. And we have even a contribution in the RC3 world about that. Yeah, thanks for that very good story. We can still do another. So the last story we're going to do yeah, we have 10 minutes left, and it's about sturdiness. And this is a word that often um, that is often a companion to us because we have to be sturdy. And it's about the GDPR when nobody had even heard of that. And when People were trying to undermine data protection in Germany and Europe, and we have a video. Oh no, we can't show the video. We'll just go on talking. We wanted to give an introduction to the video. Yeah, before GDPR, the German government always said, if there's something European, it has to be really good, and we have to have at least the standard um, switching period that we have in Germany, and so we have to be extremely careful so that everyone knows that we will introduce really good standards, but the opposite was actually the case. There was a tactic of delay so that this law would not be published. And at this point, we have to laudate Philip Albrecht, who was a reporter from uh, in the European Parliament and who sifted through the 4,000 um, change um, petitions and they were able to uh, condense it to 100 questions um, about which to vote. And the Minister Council in Germany ensured that it was further enhanced, but this is not public. And at this point, we also wanted to address the Interior Ministry because we want laws that protect us. We did a signature. Um, it, we we collected um, signatures. That was uh, fun for the press, but also for us. So. We wanted to, to take pressure to the street, and at that point, we didn't we didn't expect to have success with that. Well, maybe we kind of did because we've had so many successes in the past. So, this video is about how to brief in an. Uh, interior ministers. Today we went to the interior ministry. Privacy is lost. 
EU-Fahne. This is the EU flag. We send an open letter to Interior Minister Friedrich. Um, just um, quickly suing some um, Data protection is the prerequisite for us as autonomous people to stay independent. The more we work with the internet, the more data we have and the more manipulation takes place because I don't know who has my data. There's a tendency that companies like Facebook want to say that our private lives are public. It was a good idea to have um, data protection unified within Europe. The draft was okay. The American trade chamber sent lobbyists to Russia to put pressure on Europe and it's there's the danger that data protection as we know it and appreciate it will be lost. Only a few laws are still protecting it and now there's the lobbyist drawing and pulling on them. What do we have left? Help! My privacy! So, we, uh, on behalf of uh, Minister Friedrich, I want to give you this letter and with the signatures from many organizations. We want our interior minister to um, lobby for our interests. Terrible things are happening and our, uh, we will regret, come to regret this. So, please give this open letter to the Interior Minister with the signatures of all those who are interested in this cause. And the, there's a softening of the GDPR. Law infringements must be prosecuted. So this event, the, these naked citizens, um, that was actually moving and uh, we want, do not want to lower the German standards that we have. More data means more data protection. And I think it's very important to make that clear. Uh, there are strong rules. We want strong rules for product development so that people are protected. So, das war also dieses Video, da haben wir ihn ja auch gehört, wie er gesagt hat, ah, wir wollen da sogar noch eine Schippe drauf. So, that was the video and you heard him say that, oh, though we want to increase standards, but it turned out in the end, many of our demands did actually find their way into the GDPR and also this selection uh, from Padelun, this issue of um, reliability, that strong data protections depend on, uh, that has been taken as a role model because it actually helps business. And so we know that it's worth fighting for. We started a bit late. Uh, we didn't actually overrun that badly. So that takes us to the end. And uh, we hope that someone is still with us. And uh, thank you for 
telling the tales and uh, I know that there are many more stories that we will have to get out of you somehow. Thank you also to Lena uh, for the presentation. This will be continued. Thank you so much. It was incredibly much interesting detail. <laughs> now, please be quiet. We have a question from the audience, actually. I don't know how we can pass it on. First, big thanks. We have one question, but we don't have a sound here in Bielefeld. The question is, who who is that four-legged being in the background? What's what's that dog's race and, and what's the dog's name? Okay, I have to say, this is Cookie. You have to accept a Cookie. You cannot kick Cookie away. It's a female Maltese uh, mix and totally cute. And it's it, it charms the whole office. But, but it's never going to be auctioned off or sold in the shop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as I said, I would love to hear more. I would love to hear more, but I believe that uh, we do want to go to bed now. So have a very nice evening. And yeah, thank you for this fantastic end to the day and we'll meet again at Chaos Studio Hamburg. Thank you to Hamburg, thank you to everyone with us and thanks for the incredible frame building in Hamburg and here as well at M26. Good night.